I am sick and tired of all them nutsack faces on YouTube trying to talk about the hidden gems and all these games that you can find at a flea market or a yard sale and sell for big cash. Guess what? Those days are over. The days of ripping off old ladies, the days of grabbing stuff out of, you know, Uncle, Uncle Tommy's basement. That is done with. You cannot find these fucking games anymore. They are gone. They are on people's shelves. Or they're on eBay, or they're here at Toy Vault at a very fine price. But what I'm here to do for you today is a special video with a bunch of brand new games that you can find at pretty reasonable prices. But the thing is, these reasonable prices are good now. But then, down the road, I guarantee, this is the Pauly Sarantino guarantee seal of approval that these games are one day going to be worth tens, if not tens of thousands of dollars. The video is supposed to cut the fucking camera. The video is supposed to cut to the to the song where I start doing the doing the dance, the theme song. I got a new camera crew. I, I fired Tony. He was he couldn't even get the lights from flickering. They were flickering on and off. I look like a like a like a goddamn amateur when I've been doing this stuff for decades. Tony, he's out in the streets. I fired his ass. We got a new guy. We got a new guy on the camera. We got Glenn Chesa. You don't know who Glenn is. He was the most fantastic video game composer in the early in the early 80s, right before the video game crashed, before the Nintendo blew up and made the scene big again. Before that, forget the Koji Kondos. Forget about them. The only person that you could ever hear the name that always rung a bell that you knew. The music was going to be fan-fucking-tastic was Glenn Chesa. You know, he's got a little bit of a rough life right now. He's not doing that good with the finances. So what we're doing, we hired him here to work on the cameras, to work on the lighting. And I think he's doing a great job. And you'll see so in this video. He can diddle around on the keyboard, and then he can fucking, you know, fix all the lights and the fixtures. Okay, let's go. This is the true video for hidden gems that are going to get you a lot of money down the road. And I'm telling you this because I'm your friend. I could be keeping this information secret. So I could have all the stuff on Toy Vault shelves, but don't worry. I think this is an investment for myself. You're going to come back and say, hey, guys, listen, Paulie gave me the best information, the best advice. And that's why, um, that's why you should all be shopping at Toy Vault. So today we're going to start with just a few games, just three games. There's many more. I'm going to start with the Slim Pickens. The Slim Pickens. These are games that you can get on the cheap. For the most part, you can get on the cheap. They will be worth tens, if not tens of thousands of dollars. And we'll give you that information right now, right here. Only a toy vault. Let's do it. Okay, guys, here we go. Today, we're going to start with a little something in the obscure PS1 genre. Back in the day, when these games came out, nobody wanted them. They were in the bargain bins. They, they were just, you know, they were, uh, they were objectively pieces of shit. And then what happened is that over time, people saw them and they go, oh, that game's quirky. I don't see it everywhere. So now it's good. Now it's worth money. And now we gotta have it for a very high price. So these games are not quite there yet. But oh boy, oh Molly, they're gonna be gigantic, huge financial investments if you get yourselves these bad boys on hand right now. Get them now, sell them later. Put a down payment on your house, you can pay for your kids' college. You might be looking at these covers and say, Paulie, what in God's name is this horrible looking slop? Hey buddy, you might be right. But I'm going to tell you a little bit. Oh, Jesus Christ, I'm messing up the merchandise. Listen, these games are going to get you far in life. I'm telling you right now. And what we're going to do, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each one of them. Starting right now with... Oh, shit. Right now with Incredible Crisis. Incredible Crisis. This game, my lord, when you first look at it, the first thing you notice is how terrible the cover is. Just look at this thing. Oh my god, what do we got going on here? We got some volcano guy, and he's just like blowing steam out of his head, out of his ears, and then you got the funny looking uh, psychedelic font saying Incredible Crisis. No idea. You have zero idea what this game's like from this cover. None. None whatsoever. It could be a volcano simulator. You'd be like, what the fuck? I have no idea. For whatever reason, you know, when these kind of quirky Japanese games come over to America, it's almost like they want to bring the games over. Yeah, the Japanese quirky games, they have a market. They're going to sell well. But I don't think we want to give it a quirky Japanese cover. We're going to give it this vague as fuck, horrible, non-descriptive shit cover. 
maybe maybe random people will buy it. Maybe the Madden fans will pick it up. I was gonna get Game Day 98. Instead, I decided to get Incredible Crisis. That's what they might have been thinking, and I think that's the reason why Titus, the publisher, they ain't around no more. I don't think so. It's a real quirky game that's that's comprised of a bunch of mini games. Okay, the graphics are pretty pretty cute. They're pretty good for PS1. I'm not gonna lie, I was actually surprised. You go in there, you do your, your funny little dances, you run away from boulders and all this stuff. You know, it's it's a lot of button mashing, quick time events, just a bunch of nonsense. It's not very deep or very well thought out, but it's it's enjoyable. You, your, your attention is actually caught when you're playing the game. And that's surprising. In this day and age, that's surprising, especially popping in a PS1 because when you go back and you're like, oh, PS1, I haven't played that in a while. You look at those murky gray shit-stained graphics. You're like, oh, god damn. No wonder I don't play this garbage anymore. It's pretty good. Better than I expected. I popped this bad boy in. I had a little fun with it. The music on the other The music makes it. The music is by the Tokyo Ska Paradise Orchestra. I don't know who that is, but it sounds impressive and a little intimidating, I'll be honest. Paradise Orchestra, that's gonna be fan-fucking-tastic. And it is fantastic. It's good goddamn tunes. I'll tell you, I made a little video just dancing to some of the tunes because it was so good, I just couldn't get my, couldn't get my feet from just shuffling around. I was so into the music. This game, if you find it for the cheaps, you should pick it up. Very good. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a multi, multi tens to thousands of dollars sellers. I, I'm telling you right now, I can just, I can just feel it. And even that shitty cover, the yellow, the, this, this cover, even though it's so bad, I mean, at the same time, it, it, it brings people in. Like, what is that slop? What is that? Anyway, don't play it on anything besides a PS1 or maybe a PS2 with the regular composite cables. All of these games that have to do with, um, you know, button matching, quick time events, rhythm, um, anything like that, tapping on the on the right box and stuff. The latency and input lag. Playing anything on PS1 on a PS3 with HDMI or component is goddamn unplayable, and you will be smashing this game into bits before you even realize how valuable it's gonna be down the road. Okay, moving on. So after looking at uh, Incredible Crisis, that got me inspired. After playing Incredible Crisis, I got inspired for the next obscure gem that's going to be worth a lot, a lot of money to be a rhythm game. And no better way to throw into the mix um, than a little something I like to call Bust the Groove 2. So Buster Groove 2 is the sequel to the Buster Groove 1 that no one has ever played. I believe in other regions this is actually called Buster Move, but they couldn't do that because of the shitty puzzle game Buster Moves that still come out, and no one has probably ever played one in at least 15 years, maybe ever. This thing came out, it's published by Enix, which is weird. You would never think that Enix would make such a goofy little rhythm game, but they did. So it's a little bit different than the normal traditional rhythm games. Personally, I love rhythm games because I am the best rhythm game player of all time. There's actually no better player in the entire world. You can throw anyone at me and I'll just dominate you and I will destroy you. So there's no contest. So this game, you just, you know, it's a little bit different than the normal rhythm games. You actually, you're, you're, you're duking it out with somebody else. It's a one-on-one -on -one battle. That's how it always works. You pick a character, you play against the other character, and you, it's almost like a, like a Street Fighter style arcade mode, but with rhythm games. Does that make that makes sense. I like that analogy. So what you do, you get this little ball, and it's just playing the beats one, two, three, four, right? And the, the fourth beat of each measure, you, you hit the goddamn button that it tells you to. An X button, triangle, whatever. So every time you successfully hit that on the fourth beat, then it gives you a little line of buttons to hit. Up, down, left, up, 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 whatever. It doesn't matter though when you hit those motherfuckers. You can just hit them whenever. You get all those commands in before the fourth beat. As long as you hit the fourth beat on time, you're good. They give you a good thumbs up ski. They give you a little cool, you start dancing around. Again, unplayable. Unplayable on new systems via HDMI. Don't even try it. The music is good in some instances. Some stages are fan fucking tastic. Let's go! 
Some are just complete and utter. What's the word? Dick. They're not good. The uh, the characters are good. They have this like futuristic uh, space slash anime, uh, very Japanese theme. They have robots. Uh, they have big feet. Um, everything's pretty cool. I, I actually, I, I enjoy it quite a bit. It's a good game. It's a good game. It actually was a little expensive, but then people started to forget about it a little bit. But I say pick it up now, and then you can just shove it down people's goddamn throats at an extremely high but fair price. Bust a groove too. This game, irritating stick. This game got a little bit a buzz. People were intrigued and interested in this game. It was popping up on some people's YouTube channels for a while. It's not good. I'll tell you right now. It's shitty. It's very, very shitty. It's uh it's one of those games that's it's it's not like over time you're like, oh, this was so shitty, but hey, I'm I'm still having fun with it. Like, you know, like 80% of the goddamn Nintendo games that were out back in the day. I know. I was like playing when I was a kid too, and I was like, how the fuck did I ever play this stuff? My god. Anyway, it's kind of like that. It reminds me of like those shitty old Nintendo games that are too hard and not fun, but for whatever reason, you're just playing it over and over. I'm getting ahead of myself. Irritating Sticks, one of these games. Um, it's incredibly Japanese. It's based off of this crappy game show. It's, it's just like the game operation. It really is. You got this fucking lightsaber thing and you got to go in between the mazes and between the bars. You got to go in between and not hit the metal rod or you get zapped. And that's really it. It supports... Dual shock with the vibration because you know you hit the little side like whoa, I'm awful. Music is like just not even really there. There's like no music really. When it was brought over to America, they didn't even like really change anything at all. Uh, it, it's a direct, it's a direct disc transfer. So what that means is it's really funny is that it's so much of a direct transfer over from the Japanese version right here, right here, that when you when you beat the when you die in the game. It says game over. You got to turn the goddamn system off. You got to turn your PlayStation off and turn it back on. And they say it has to do with like a region lockout because it thinks you're playing a Japanese game. Ain't that some shit? Shows all the heart and soul that went into putting this uh, port over to the American audience, right? Yeah, it's shockingly fun. That's what it says. Shockingly fun, which is, you know, play on words because you get zapped and stuff. Not fun at all. Very obscure game that's going to go for a ton, a ton of money. Can't get too much into this one because it's really fucking awful. But if you get, if you see it, snap it up, sell it to some schlup for a lot of money. All right, that's it, guys. We got the games right here, and they're going to be worth tons of money. And I'm giving you an exclusive insider look at these games. So if you want to make the big bucks, thinking about quitting your job, hey, I'm with you, buddy. Just go on down to some, uh, you know, some yard sales. Look like, hey, buddy, you happen to have the irritating stick for the PS1. They're going to look at you like you're a three-headed knuckle head. Go to your local yard sales, you know, and uh, just poke around and um, you see a guy with some PS1 games, go right up to him. He's like, hey, nutsack face. You happen to have some uh, irritating stick in there. You might be lucky. You might be lucky.